Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Airbnb, Yaroon Mahir, in discussion with Skip's Deanna Taylor. for joining us. Um, Thank you. So, Yuren Merhers, did I get that right? You got it. Really good. <laughs> is responsible for Airbnb's business in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, he joined Airbnb in 2012 as the country manager for Spain and Portugal, and was appointed managing director of uh, EMEA uh, just last year. So, the European region accounts for more than half of Airbnb's global business, and the company's number one market in the entire world is Paris, which is not too far from here. So before I begin to bombard Joran with a ton of questions, I'd like to remind the audience to please submit your own questions for him that we'll answer at the end of our conversation. You can do that through our mobile event app, and you can also go to slido.com and use the hashtag Skift Forum. Um, and you can also, if you don't even have a question, you can also use the upvoting feature to make sure that certain questions are, are sort of floated up to the top. Okay, so, Jorin, you have the very distinct advantage, but also a bit of a disadvantage, of overseeing a region with some of the most popular travel destinations in the world. Cities like London, Paris, Amsterdam, Barcelona, Berlin. But they're also very mature markets, so I'm wondering, where are you looking for growth for, for Airbnb in this region? So uh, it's an interesting point, right? Uh, EMEA, as you said, represents 51% of our business, and we have some of the most mature markets, the cities that you mentioned, and some of the most nascent uh, um, Middle East. There's a ton of potential. Uh, Africa, there's a ton of potential. So there's some growth there. Um, and then for our more mature markets, I think we look at growth in two different ways. So the first one, um, and going back to some of the announcement, we've, we've um, this year we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. So as part of our 10th anniversary, um, uh, it's actually 10 years already, it, time flies by since the, the two founders inflated their first air beds. A lot of things have changed. So 300 million guests later, we are about 5 million listings uh, later. Um, uh, now, if we take a look at what is up for the growth in terms of the next 10 years, um, we wanted to, first of all, make sure that we accompany the existing community that we have throughout their life cycle. So the millennials that used to travel with us um, five years ago are evolving, right? Um, they start to have kids, they start to have jobs. So that's one of the things that we weren't very clear about, about how exactly is it to, to find something that you travel for work, or um, if you're traveling with your family, how exactly do you find the right listing? Among 5 million listings, it was not that easy. So that was one of the first things that we did. So I think these are two big potentials with the collections that we have now introduced um, um, uh, earlier this year, and that's going to continue to grow. That's one. I think the other one um, is um, Airbnb Plus, which I think is very interesting and appealing for a complete new um, uh, segment of, of users who probably traditionally haven't really considered Airbnb. The, there was a bit of a trust gap um, with Airbnb Plus, where it basically is a, a bunch of uh, listings that go through a verification process, about 50 steps, making sure that there's 24-hour um, check-in, making sure that there's a, um, a broadband Wi-Fi, and so on and so on, um, that we guarantee that as part of a subset of, of listings and make it easier to find them for those hosts. So it's both a win-win situation for attracting a new, new segment as well as... Uh, um, uh, as well as for, for a, a bunch of uh, guests. Right, definitely. I know um, back in February when um, Brian Chesky, the, the CEO of Airbnb, no, made a lot yeah. of those announcements, he really, um, the sort of unifying theme that he portrayed during the, the, that announcement was that Airbnb is for everyone. Right. Is that actually possible though? Like, can Airbnb actually be for everyone without sort of losing its identity or, or losing its its origins as, as those as that place where you know Brian and um, and Joe's apartment where they blew up air beds you know yeah look everybody's different and uh -huh. our if we want to be true to our mission our mission um, I don't know how familiar people are um, it's very ambitious our mission says belong anywhere no matter where you travel we want you to feel as if you belong in that place 
Um, and it goes a little bit back to there, right? So it's super ambitious. Um, at the moment, 300 million people have traveled with us. And you go through different stages, whether it's you travel on business, um, you travel with your family, uh, you uh, want to take a city trip by yourself, whatever it is. I think there's different moments in time that require different types of hospitality. And that's what we want to offer. So there's not one specific type of customer. I think there's um, a lot of them. Um, and then even one specific customer has different moments in time that require different types of uh, accommodation. So that's one of the reasons why um, uh, if people want to travel to boutique hotels, they want to travel to uh, individual rooms, they want to travel to um, uh, lofts in the city center and so on. We want to make sure is that there's one platform where you're able to find all of those things and make it easy to find by some of the, the tools that we announced mm -hmm. uh, early this year. So it goes a little bit in that direction. We want to be true though to one thing and I think that's what unifies all of that. Um, and that's the personalized hospitality that we want to continue to, to, to drive, not just via our accommodation, but also via some of the experiences that we, that we started to offer now end of 2016. Right. Yeah. So about experiences, I know, um, I think general consensus in the, the travel industry community is that it is growing, but it's not yet profitable. Um, mm -hmm. So what's, what's going on with experiences? How are you actually going to be able to scale it to a thousand destinations by the end of this year. Yeah. So we, we started um, fairly small when we announced it end of 2016, I believe it was. So it's about a, a year and a half uh, old at the moment. Um, it was the very first time that we moved beyond accommodation. Mm -hmm. That was um, actually we made an evolution from home sharing to accommodation to an integrated travel platform that um, adds layers to that. Right. Um, our experiences was the first layer that we added to that. Um, uh, we started with about 500 um, uh, experiences, very curated in about um, 12 destinations. We are at the moment, as we develop the playbook of how exactly, one, what are users looking for? When do they want to be impacted? What is the price range? Um, and so on and so on, as we try to learn about that. At the same time, we're trying to detail exactly what is the mix of uh, type of experience that they're actually looking for and how do we achieve that? How do we get there um, right. from, a, from a business development point of view? So those are the two things that we um, have figured out now when we spend a good year working on that. Um, we have about 5,000 experiences in about 60 destinations. And we, um, uh, we want to expand it, like you said, to about a thousand destinations um, and then multiply the business times 10 in the next year as well. Yeah. So I think it has a huge potential for every euro that is being spent on mm -hmm. accommodation, three use, euros is being spent on any type of activities, mm -hmm. right? So it's an incredible market and it allows, um, again, for that people power to hospitality, for people to connect, not just from a host to guest, but even from people from the same city or um, uh, people to spend some time um, uh, practicing their passions. Right, and as you scale it up though, I wonder, will the process be, the vetting process or the approval process for those experiences, mm -hmm. is it going to be as detailed as it was when, when you first launched? I, I remember having some conversations with a lot of your an initial um, sort of mm -hmm. tour guides or experience guides, um, experience hosts, um, yep. and, and the process was was pretty intense. It was it was not an easy No, no, it was, it was incredibly yeah. intense. Yeah. Um, and, and I think I think it's part of the learning process. It's exactly the same thing as we what we went through via our accommodation business. So in the accommodation business, very early days, um, uh, and I think it's a really strategic advantage if you're very small that you have that one-to-one -one connection with your host, with your travelers, right? And learn from them. Meet every single one of them. I think the two founders, what they did exceptionally well in the beginning um, is they traveled to New York, which was their biggest market back then. Um, to meet up with all of those saying, what is working? What is not working? What do you want to do that you cannot do? Um, understand it, have that personalized thing. The same thing on trips. When we start off, we want to um, come to market really quickly and then try to identify instead of us dictating, here's what everybody should use, tell us, have that interaction. Um, but it requires a lot of handholding. Mm -hmm. As you get more mature there and develop a standardized playbook, you see, oh, that's working. That is interesting. Um, mm -hmm. You can start automate that. So um, from a business point of view, we don't want to be, um, uh, we're more of a technology company than uh, a, a, a resource heavy uh, a company. So we try to solve it um, from a technology point of view, but we need to know what we're solving first. And as we, um, a, a lot of these these new verticals that we're adding are pretty greenfield, so they're, they're pretty new and we always start with a blank sheet of paper. Um, there needs to be that human handholding, that knowledge deep diving process in between. Right. Okay, that's interesting. So you mentioned that that, that Airbnb sort of, sort of sees itself as more of a technology company, more of a, 
platform than necessarily. Yeah, I think uh, we're we're an enabler. So I hear uh -huh. people talking about robots are going to replace um, uh, jobs and so on. Mm -hmm. I think we want to use technology, um, but we're in a and we're very clear about that. We're in a people powered industry. Hospitality is about people. So mm -hmm. we don't, and I don't think it's possible to replace people. I think we want to empower people, both our hosts, our guests, to, through technology to make that whole process of people connecting, making it easier. Yeah. So I have a question for you. So sometimes when I when I speak to a lot of um, my sources for stories on, on Airbnb coverage, um, they've noticed, they, they pointed something out to me, which I, I wanted to ask you about, um, speaking of people-powered businesses. Um, so, you know, the EMEA region, it does account for the majority of Airbnb's global business. But I think a lot of people have noticed that there's not quite as much of a large presence um, from this particular region when it comes to Airbnb's core executive leadership team based in San Francisco. Um, so I was wondering, you know, is that going to change going forward, given that the importance of this region and this market? Yeah, I, this is a constant debate that, that we're having. I, mean, I think you and I are very aligned. I, I, maybe we can use you as an ambassador internally to, <laughs> to advocate for some of that. Um, it, it's... It's definitely one of the, the pain points, right? So we talk a lot about uh, diversity and it's something that we take extremely serious. Um, this for me is another part of the diversity. Um, being a global company um, should have a global leadership and, and this is something that we're striving towards. I think we're making a lot of good steps in the, in the, the right direction. Um, the person that we recently uh, hired um, from, uh, from Amazon um, mm -hmm. was during five years, he was the vice president of Amazon in, in, in Europe and brings tremendous experience and local knowledge about that region. And that's going to change the dynamic. So I'm super um, hopeful for for um, the, the future, but you're absolutely yeah. right. That's good. Good to hear. Um, so also speaking of, of um, sort of extending from what your answer previously, you know, do you think Airbnb has sort of the resources and the infrastructure to be a sort of, uh, this is a term that I, I know Chip Conley used to use a lot, a super brand of travel or, you know, is Airbnb just another OTA or is it different? Um, and, you know, how are you going to, you know, get into flights or transportation or all these other sort of things that, that we've seen from other more traditional online travel agencies? Yeah. So um, I think there's two questions there. Um, I, I think the first one is, are we another OTA? I'd like, I, I think we're significantly different in, in a way that um, I see it transaction OTA um, versus what we're trying to do is, is more about people. Um, um, and that's a little bit the approach we take, right? So um, everything that we try to do and is true to our, our mission, coming back to that, of the, the belonging anywhere, I think people are um, uh, really centric to that. And then the model that we try to promote is one about um, uh, making sure that our community is at the center of everything and that's how we've grown. That's what we traditionally did really well. Um, we need to make sure NPS, we were talking about that before, it's a huge metric for us. 60% of, um, of our growth is organic growth of word of mouth, people recommending, hey, I've used Airbnb over Christmas, New Year, and so on. It's a great, and we see that working tremendously. So, um, but it only works if you do really well and it has um, X times more impact if you don't do things well. So if your NPS starts to go down, you, you really um, uh, struggle there. So that's uh, the, the growth from comes from within the, 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 um, uh, the community. I think 70% um, or 72%, I think, of all of the listings that we have is unique to Airbnb and um, our individuals still sharing their, uh, their homes. We just want to make sure is that we add um, uh, other types of verticals, other types of accommodation to that as we continue to grow. So I think there's significant differences um, between the two models. Um, we believe obviously in, in ours, which is, um, uh, which is community driven instead of a commodity driven uh, right. approach. When are flights taking off? Any word on that? So we, we announced flights uh, a few years trips. ago, uh -huh. exactly. Um, uh, it's not high on the radar at the moment. So it's something that was mentioned in the heat of the moment, I think. Um, look, we. We're announcing a lot of things, which is which is great. Now, I think in the next year or so, we need to make sure is that we execute really well on what we announce. There's so many things that we're able to do. Um, I think with the experiences, Airbnb for work um, at plus, there's three huge potential um, uh, verticals that we're going into. Mm -hmm. So I think now it's time to execute um, on the strategy that we set forward uh, instead of start thinking about 
the next uh, wave of things that could be added to it. So let's execute and then and then talk about new announcements. Yeah. So also hearkening back to uh, Brian's announcement in February, um, he made some recent remarks there that that seemed to sort of suggest the very beginnings of a new era in sort of. Airbnb's disruption, um, sort of heralding this new era of, of online travel battles. Uh, that this notion or idea that Airbnb can really challenge booking and Expedia um, and all the other, you know, online travel giants. Um, it's funny because, you know, maybe just until last year, everyone thought that you were at war with hotels. Um, and now everyone's saying that you're, you're going to battle with uh, booking and Expedia. So what's different about this new perceived battle? Uh, what are people getting right about it? What are they misinterpreting it? And what advantage does Airbnb have over these other yeah, competitors? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of talking about wars and battles and, and so on. I mean, they resonate like really well. Uh, exactly. Um, uh, look, I, I, I both Booking, Expedia, they do a fantastic job and the growth rates that they've seen are, are tremendous. I think what we are, um, we're, we're the newcomer in, in this, right? So um, we have the luxury of saying, what do we want the next 10 years of tourism to be? And I think it's pretty clear that if you take a look now, um, at what is happening with tourism, we talked uh, about it a little bit before, right? Over tourism, sustainable tourism, uh, and so on. It's becoming uh, an issue. So um, this is something that I think we, uh, we want to be accountable for that and we want to be um, uh, trying to addressing uh, it. So that's something that I think we take very serious. Um, and it's also something that I think sets us apart with some of the, the, the other OTAs. So we talked about commodity versus uh, community approach. I think our community can help solve that over tourism uh, by one, um, allowing a broader range of uh, the population to participate in the wealth that is being generated and then also some of the decentralization that is happening and some of the social finding again that social connection that travel was missing a little bit and um, coming back to that so uh, so we, we talked about some of the more technical differences before whether it's the the the, the rates that is being charged uh, whether it's the the payments that are being managed and so on um, I think uh, the 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 more conceptual is about the sustainable tourism and um, community commodity uh, discussion. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, what yeah, does, I know, I think this mic might be off, um, but uh, what does the future of online travel or travel in general, global travel, what does it look like in Airbnb's eyes? Um, like I asked before, can Airbnb really be for everyone? What does the company's evolution over the past decade really sort of say about where travel is headed? What does it say about where the private accommodation sector is headed. Yeah, so so when when we started, I think we consolidated something that um, had been done on a very scattered basis uh, on and off. Can everybody hear me? Because I, yeah? yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, uh, um, uh, we consolidated that, so basically created home sharing. Um, from home sharing became an accommodation uh, company. Um, and then, like I was saying before, we added layers on that. So we basically become an integrated travel platform, always with that um, people-centric uh, uh, optics. That's where we invest a lot of time in. Right. Um, so we want to be um, uh, staying, staying true to that. And I think that's going to be the key of the future. I think people are looking for um, more of an experienced type uh, um, uh, yeah, time um, uh, uh, destination I instead of um, instead of having the cookie cutter approach of saying uh, here's what is available for your and you have to take it um, we want to be the platform that allows that and that allows um, for people to to connect in order to find hey what is the right host to have an experience with what is the right host to to um, uh, stay with and and so on so I think we're we're going from a, a more standardized approach to a more um, uh, look and find and and basically take whatever you configure your own your own uh, trip. So that's where we're going. We want to make sure is that we provide all the tools for people to be able to do that. Right. So a much more personalized type of approach. Yes, to, to definitely travel. Yeah. personalized and I think experience driven. Mm -hmm. I think those are the two, and that's one of the reasons why our experiences. I have extremely high hopes about, about that. And uh, I think it could be a big differentiator. Right. So you mentioned Airbnb Plus, um, and 
you know, it's so funny because earlier this week, um, Myriad announced uh, its pilot mm -hmm. with Hostmaker in London to sort of kind of basically do a very similar product to Airbnb Plus um, with a, diff a couple differences. Um, and then you also have companies like Hyatt and the core yep. also sort of playing in, in the space. Um, and you've also got Beyond by Airbnb launching later this year, which is a much more luxury, luxury right. driven product. Um, so I was just wondering, how do you sort of see this move toward a lot more professionalization and standardization in private accommodations um, ultimately playing out? Yeah, and, and we have Marriott later on, I think, uh, right, uh, right after <laughs> right now. After um, uh, so, so it's definitely an interesting uh, move. And I, for, for us, it shows something we were talking about it before. What we've seen for a little while is that um, the concept of uh, home sharing and staying in a, in a flat instead of a hotel room is something that people want and it's not just the the very few uh, uh people um uh, the millennials anymore i think it's pretty much everybody right um uh, uh the most proactive brands and, and hotel companies are starting to to um uh, pick up on that and and generate whether it's the spin-off brands or invest in some of the other companies and and so on uh for i i welcome it i mean i i think it's it's great that we start to normalize uh, that and as we do that, more and more brands will, will pick up. Um, so there's definitely going to be some kind of uh, consolidation and we'll see who's doing the distribution, who's doing the management, who's doing the real estate. I think those are a little bit the three verticals that is going to um, uh, pop out. Um, and, and where does everybody take, take their stakes and make their bets? One last question for me. Will we ever see those, quote, mass-produced hotels like the likes of Marriott, Hilton, Hyatt on the Airbnb platform? Can you, can you succeed and take on Booking and Expedia without having them on your platform? It's not something that we are foreseeing now. Um, <laughs> I think the potential uh, that, that we're going towards are more of the bed and breakfast and boutique hotels. Um, there's some of them that provide an exceptional service. Uh, never say never, right? But it's <laughs> not something that is top of mind for us. They have other distribution channels, they have a very strong brand, so they have a lot of direct traffic. I don't think this is the, the place where we can basically have an impact. And I don't think that our community is waiting for another distribution channel to find exactly that. What we, what I do think that we want to do is um, enable both the boutique and the, the, the bed and breakfast. And we already have, and this was, that's why it's an announcement, but of something that was already happening on our platform. We already have more than 200,000 uh, bed and breakfast on our platform. Oh. If you think about it, the very first uh, Airbnb listing was a bed and breakfast, right? So they're there for the name. Um, uh, we have seen in the last year 500% growth rates in the amount of boutique hotels that have joined the platform. So it's something that was already happening, but they didn't really have the tools in order to do so. So that's why we provided those tools or we're in the process of providing those tools in order to um, uh, really enable them as well. So um, uh, to answer your question, I, I don't think this is going to be the top priority uh, for us right now, but never say never. Right. Okay, so let's get to the questions from the audience. So um, our first one is, Airbnb has been linked with over-tourism, negative effects, effects by driving up real estate prices for local people. What's your take on that? Yeah, so um, first of all, I think over-tourism is something that is not specific to Airbnb. It was asked before on, on uh, but the, the, the package travel industry, same thing. I think it's, it's a phenomenon that we, we should evaluate. Um, I think we have a role to play in it. But we we and we need to um, uh, take control of it. So um, the the one thing that I, I I would say one with regards to over tourism, and then I'll come back to the real estate uh, prices. So um, over tourism for me is is where we have an opportunity. Um, if you take a look at where the distribution is of the Airbnb listings in a specific city um, versus the more standardized um, uh, hotel uh, locations. I think we have an ability to redistribute some of uh, some of that and basically in the Venice, the Barcelonas, the Amsterdams of the world, being able to redistribute some of that pressure um, on certain, uh, certain uh, districts. And then with regards to real estate, I'm always a little bit surprised when I get this question because the, the very first listing and the two founders when they created Airbnb, um, they weren't able to pay their rent. So the very first risk thing that was created was in order to tackle exactly that. So now it's flipped. Um, and we get we get a lot of people, um, about 53% um, of the people who rent on Airbnb are saying, I'm doing this in order to pay my rent still. So it's very true to the original DNA, right? Um, and if it wasn't for Airbnb, I would not be able to stay in the listing that I'm, um, uh, to, to live in the house that I'm living in at the moment. So I think 
um, there's definitely a uh, um, housing crisis in certain districts and certain uh, cities. Um, I think we're more a solution than anything else. And if you think about it, um, I, I live in, in Barcelona. So Madrid, for example, um, we have about 14,000 listings in Madrid. Um, there's 135,000 empty houses in the city. That's about 10 times um, bigger and I think a 10 times bigger opportunity in terms of the housing prices and the crisis being generated. So all of the studies that we've seen at least is there no to a very minimal impact on, on housing prices. doesn't mean that there's no housing crisis in certain cities, but the impact that we have, I think, is very minimal. Right. And one last question from the audience. I think this, this question about um, hotel companies like Merit and Accor getting into the space and having the power of, of large loyalty programs behind them, I think that feeds into Superguest. Um, Anything you can tell us about Superguest, which is... So, yeah, we, we, we wanted to make sure is that what is Superghost or Superguest, and for those of you who don't know, um, there are loyalty programs that, we, that we've announced. It's not going to be um, a, another point scheme type miles and more and so on. I think, uh, again, we started with a white sheet of paper taking a look, what can we do different? So that's what we like to do. Um, uh, so it's more of um, uh, an Amazon Prime kind of uh, thing yeah. that al allows us to to provide certain benefits and, and so on. So we're thinking at, at this moment in time about how exactly it's going to going to happen and what exactly is going to be included. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity. It's something that we're missing at the moment. Um, uh, nothing more to announce about it's apart from what we said already. launching this summer? It's launching right after the summer. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. It was thank you so for having me. To meet with you. It's thank you. Honor.